Thank you very much for that uh, amazing, generous introduction. I can hardly wait to hear myself speak up. <laughs> um, I need to say I'm here tonight with a degree of mixed emotion. Firstly, a lot of apprehension. Like, how do you follow the act of Joel and that amazing choir? Um, they were just sensational. They just lifted our spirits. I want to say to you, Joel, and to all the choir members, that was amazing. And uh, certainly, I think all of us just were so moved by that. Really appreciate it. Sorry now that I have to follow. <laughs> Secondly, um, the last uh, seven days, I've just been on the road non-stop uh, all over the country. I've been running workshops up in the Hunter Valley. I had, had to go out in the Udadana Trail to run a community planning session in Australia's smallest town, <coughs> William Creek population five. <laughs> Fortunately, there were 11 people at the workshop and uh, that kind of like helped. And then I uh, went back in my own state and I was in uh, Geraldton last night running a workshop. The only problem with that is if uh, you know about us in the West, we're two hours behind you and uh, trying to get here tonight meant I had to be on a nine o'clock flight and I finished a workshop in Geraldton at eight o'clock and then it's a four and a half hour drive through the night to get to the airport. So I drove 900 kilometres yesterday and did a three hour workshop. And I, mean, I don't say that except I'm feeling stuffed. And uh, I just, it's a way of apologising, but it reminds me of this guy called the Duke of Devonshire. I don't know if you know this guy, but he was a British politician around the turn of the century back there in the 1900s. And uh, one night he dreamt he was addressing the House of Lords in London and woke up to find he was. And uh, I always think that could be my experience tonight. So. But on the positive side, I'm excited to be here really for six good reasons. The first I want to do is just always to acknowledge our traditional owners. And I don't do that out of tokenism, I don't do it because you're meant to do it. I do it out of profound respect for the incredible stewardship that our indigenous people across this amazing country, this collection of tribes and, and uh, nations have done for us. Their stewardship of this land, we are privileged to be part now of the longest continuous culture anywhere in the world. And uh, to them, I say thank you for your incredible stewardship for over 70,000 years. Um, it's an amazing kind of like contribution that we are all beneficiaries of. I particularly want to share the fact that they have helped me to appreciate this thing called country. And one of those mentors in my life once gave me that. We care for country so that country can care for us. Take care of country, it will take care of you. Take what you need from country, but need what you take. And so the wisdom of Indigenous people, I just want to say thank you for it. But I need to say six good reasons why I'm excited to be here first. This is Melbourne. You are the most exciting city in the world. I wouldn't want to live here permanently because of your weather. We live in the best place in WA. But you know, this is an amazing city and I just love to be in it. And our most colourful Prime Minister, Paul Keating, once said he'd love to be in Melbourne just to perv on the buildings. And, uh, <laughs> and I can really identify with kind of like Paul Keating. You have by far the best heritage buildings of anywhere. I need to say, though, the ultimate is to be at the MCG. But I am a DACA supporter. Is there any other Frio DOC? We've got two in the audience. But I need to say, 13 days ago, I was there with my daughter. We go regularly to games, and we decided that one of those interstate trips had to be the MCG to play Essendon uh, uh, um, 13 days ago. And was it shattering? There was us, five goals up, and we end up losing by that one point. We were shattered. <laughs> and all I could say to my daughter, who was just absolutely distraught as we walked out, Ellie, we didn't lose again tonight. We just ran out of time. And uh, it didn't comfort her, I'm sure. But to be at the MCG, those of us who love this game called Aussie Rules, it is the ultimate. The second reason I'm excited to be here is really to be with creative people. And we've all had an amazing taste of that tonight. I love kind of like what uh, the brochure says about this weekend. The conference for musicians, artists, creators, and those who want to connect with them to build caring and healthy communities. So I'm excited to be here around that particular theme. 
The group I work with, the Bank of Ideas, we have a very, very simple kind of like vision, and that is to encourage and support communities to be healthy, caring, and enterprising places where all members belong, matter, and contribute. That's what I'm on about. I think that's what the theme of this conference is about. And the theme that I particularly want to push is that last word. We are not here to help people. We are here to create a community for all of us. And that's very different from the mindset that we're here to kind of like help people. I want people engaged as co-workers, co-designers, co-producers of what's going on in our communities and not as recipients of what that community can do for them. So that'll be part of the theme that I really want to develop tonight because I'm a community enthusiast. I believe passionately in this. After my own personal faith and my family, nothing is more important to me than this thing called community. It has a geographic sense that there's also communities of interest. But this thing called community, call it a clan, call it what you like, but it's where there's a sense of connection, where we belong, where people care for us. And to me, how we deepen this is one of the great kind of like challenges. And particularly at the local level, after what we've been through in terms of COVID and so on, I love the word of Amanda Abrams, in a world where the social fabric seems to be rapidly fraying, the economy's uncertain, the future of the planet's at risk, is there a better way to hit the reset button but to come back to neighbourhood level and begin to genuinely rely on each other again? And I suppose what I'm committed to is how do we rebuild this sense of community? Because unfortunately, and you can tell from the colour of my head, I've been around, kind of like in this stuff now for over five decades, and I have seen a deterioration in what we call community development. It has now evolved into where we do things to and for people. To me, that isn't the model that I was brought up in, in terms of what community is about. And so I'm really excited about trying to remind people that this thing called community matters, and that whatever the issue, whether it be loneliness, whether it be poverty, whether it be unemployment, whether it be the lack of services, whether it be the cost of living, you know what, the answer is not the latest government program, it's community. Community can do anything if we can collect kind of like bond together. I love what this guy said, community has the power to change everything. No amount of innovation, individual brilliance or money can transform our broken societies effectively and as sustainably as building community. And I suppose I love the fact that that is very much about what you want to dwell on this weekend as you come together and say, how can the arts be a major force and a process in making all of that actually happen? Third reason I'm excited to be here is this weekend is about a learning experience for all of us. I love those words, very Hoffer, in times of change, it's the learners who inherit the future. Those of us who have finished learning find ourselves to be equipped in a world that no longer exists. And the challenge I have all the time is encouraging people to look with fresh eyes at what they're doing. Look at fresh eyes at that community, whether it be a community of interest or a geographic community, saying, how can we do it smarter? How can we do it better? How can we do it more relevantly? How can we do it more effectively? And that's the value of kind of like committing to a whole weekend, coming together and very much learning from each other. One of the great... Uh, heroes in my life, a faith guy out of the Maritimes region out of Canada, Moses Cody, who revolutionised communities there during the Depression, helped to set up well over 700 community co-ops, got people saying, become masters of your own destiny, we together can do things. And I love one of his words, the person who has, has ceased to learn ought not to be allowed to wander around in these dangerous times. And I love that. I love those particular words and so on. The fourth reason I'm excited to be here is to be energised by all you people in the room. I wouldn't see myself as a greatly creative arts person. I was a great singer before tunes came out and that totally <laughs> wrecked me. But uh, I have great admiration for people and I love the theme made to create. Created in God's image, how important all this is about. And when I read up about the range of initiatives that people are doing, it's just amazing where the Salvation's Army Act is at in terms of kind of like the creative areas. And the amazing range of initiatives across our country that's being developed. And obviously, people are finding...
I think that a, a relevant way to reconnect to kind of like this Christian faith. And I think that's incredibly exciting. I love what some of our famous people had to say about the arts. Look at Einstein. I often think in music. I live my daydreams in music. I see my life in terms of music. I know that the most joy in my life has come from my violin. You know, people like that. And the one by George Bernard Shaw. Amazing. I love the words of this woman when she said, before a child talks, they sing. Before they write, they draw. As soon as they stand, they dance. Art is a fundamental to human expression. And I think the arts have just got such a powerful role to play in building community and, let me say, in renewing the church. And I think that's incredibly exciting. Martin Luther put it very well. He was a pretty boring kind of guy in many ways, but beautiful music is the art of the prophets that can calm the agitations of the soul. It's one of the most magnificent, delightful presents that God has given us. And so again, I think we can all kind of like say amen to some of the stuff that these people are saying about the role that music can actually play. And I love what your own conference flyer said. The arts are a powerful way to build connection and create healthy communities. The arts are an ideal way for caring for people and creating new, unique faith pathways that can be used effectively to work for justice. And I suppose that's why I'm excited to be here, is to learn from you in terms of where these arts and the role that you can play in this thing called community building. I'm particularly excited to spend a weekend with people of faith who have a very clear mission of what they're on about. Our vision is to transform Australia one life at a time with the love of Jesus. And I think how we make that contemporary, how do we become relevant to people? And again, I think the arts are really one of the most effective ways that we can really, again, get back to what Christ has called us to do in terms of extending his kingdom. Your famous um, founder, Booth, I love reading some of his quotes. He was really out there. He was off the planet at times. So I thought he was just amazing. And I love this one. If I thought I could win one more soul to the Lord by walking on my head and playing the tambourine on my toes, I'd learn how. And I just love that passion. I love to see people who've got that. I love, as I've read about him, the way he used to talk about go and do something. He was just very practically orientated. I love the fact that one of his first missions he ran was a big tent in a graveyard. You can't get more creative than that in terms of kind of like trying to find a way of kind of like reaching out to people and what it's on about. And as a boy brought up in the city of Fremantle, I still have such vivid memories of those kind of like street band kind of like things that went on and the courage that people had within a working class port city like that to get out and talk. And the way they'd wander into the pubs with the War Cry magazine and, and rattle the can and get people kind of like committed to kind of like contributing to do things. They left me with a lot of kind of like courage about what it is. I'm not a Salvation Army member, I'm a Baptangle Methodian investigation. <laughs> I, uh, I belong to all of them, I work with all of them. I am though a follower of this person Christ and I am excited about my own kind of like memories of what the Salvation Army have done and, uh, and uh, what it's done. I live in the city of Kalamunda. Our mayor is an ex-Salvation Army woman, one of your famous band people, and I love having conversation with Margaret Thomas or Margaret Finn, if some of you knew her, um, to hear her on our... Um, uh, you know, Anzac Memorial, five o'clock as the sun's rising and she's playing the last post. She always gives acknowledgement to her involvement with the Salvation Army and what music <coughs> meant to her in growing up. And I suppose for many of us, we have such great memories of that. And then there were other salvos who influenced my life. <laughs> Captain David Eldridge, remember him? David was one of the mentors in my life. David has actually influenced how I view kind of like youth and community development. I always remember that amazing initiative he did for the Prime Minister now 20 odd years ago where he looked at how do communities create meaningful pathways for young people. And that report is still probably the best document I know in youth development in Australia. And in it, that chapter five where it talks about successful communities who really know how to help their young people. And what do they look like? 
And at the heart of it were seven characteristics of a healthy, caring community. And I owe so much to this crazy guy. I owe so much to what he has introduced me to. So I really wanted to acknowledge David, Captain David Eldridge tonight. I don't think he dresses like that most of the time. And finally, why I'm excited to be here is I'm a disturber. I'm one of those people that like to provoke and get people thinking and asking, is there a smarter, different way that we can actually do? And there are so many wonderful words by your Salvation Army Booth originators, whether it be William or whether it be his daughter, who are talking about unless we change the present, how we do things, we'll never inherit a better future. And I'm one of those people who particularly want to say, when I come to community development, too much of it is about servicing people and community and not enough about strengthening people and community. It is about often turning people into being a recipient of what we are going to kind of like do for them, rather than them being a co-owner, a co-participant in what we're on about. And so I'm particularly interested, as one of your writers put, Rod, you put it very well, when community members come to a business, they engage in a transaction and a service is provided. When community members come to the Salvation Army, our prayer is that the engagement is more than a transaction. Our vision is to transform Australia one life at a time with the love of Jesus. This is much more than a transaction in God's purpose. That that transformation will be mutual for us and the community member. And I suppose I want to take that over tomorrow when I run a series of the workshops to get you thinking about what does that mean in terms of kind of how we do community development. Now, I started in this stuff 50 years ago as a detached youth worker working for uh, an Anglican youth service in the East End of London. It was a 24-hour youth centre that ran seven days a week. It was one of the best ways to ever be introduced to youth and community development. And our team leader was a guy called Snowy Duvall. And I'll never forget when I started my first day, he took me aside as this young youth worker and said, can I give you three pieces of advice? Firstly, your role is to make everybody feel a somebody. Secondly, never do anything for anyone they can do for themselves. Don't rob people of that. And thirdly, the key question you've got to ask people is what matters to you, not what's the matter. Almost the same words, but it actually conjures a totally different response. I need to say, over the years, I've forgotten the advice of Snowy. I went on to head an employment department in Western Australia. I've been involved in a whole pile of international development projects in a whole pile of countries. And I reached a point, though, that I suddenly realised, you know what? I have forgotten Snowy's advice. I'd become part of a system that actually was on about servicing people, all in the name of help, all in the name of being helpful. But in the end, we were not strengthening community. And so through the Bank of Ideas, I've actually looked at how do we move from just doing things to people and for people? Is there some other elements? Maybe it's also about doing things with people. But maybe even more important, it's about opening the space of often by the people. And so my idea of community development is very different to what I think has been practiced and what we're currently spending billions of dollars on. I'm interested in making results. Because that model, which is the current model that occupies massive amount of funding from governments, is all top down, outside in. It always starts with what's wrong in community. It always starts with a half empty bit of the glass. Seems always a bit dumb, but it's all about needs analysis. It's all about servicing need. And the only way you can do that is to create programs and services. And then we actually create a whole language for people. Today, local governments don't talk about community members, they talk about customers. The health department talks about consumers of their services. And an NGO, we use that horrible word, clients. Do you know where the word client comes from? It comes from a Latin word meaning I'm lying on my back, helpless and hopeless, and I need someone to help me stand up. Not really useful language. The language is all about you are a recipient of what I, thank God, are doing for you. And I suppose I'm interested 
and beginning to challenge that. I'm interested in moving away with the fact that what that does is to create silos where we divide people's lives up into an education bit, a health bit, kind of like an employment bit or whatever, and really do they all come together. The focus is definitely on servicing community, not necessarily strengthening community. And for that model to happen, there's a lot of people like me and you often, the kind of like who are the paid professionals to do it. Now there is a role for that. There are people in need and we need to respond to that. But if that's the only model that we're offering, we will continue to see the results of it. And the results are not good. Despite the fact that this has been the dominant model now for well over 30 years in this country, all the indicators to do with family and child poverty, homelessness, closing the gap indicators in the Aboriginal communities, domestic violence, they're all going up, not down. And yet we continue to do what we've always done. And in the result, we continue to get what we've always got. And then when we look at what I call the community connection bit, we have an Omnipol that's done every year, this is the one just before COVID, and the results are not great. It indicates that over a 30 year period, the average Australian has three less friends than they used to. The fact that one in five people say they have no one to turn to in terms of difficulty. And yet that model, we continue to perpetuate. This Omnipol asks four very simple questions. I love them. How many people around here can you turn to in times of difficulty? How many people living around here can ask small favours of? How many friends could you turn up without an invitation? <coughs> Amongst family and friends, how many people easily available you could talk frankly to without having to watch your words? Have a look at the results from 1994. Rapid decline. And yet we continue to practice a model and that's where governments are pumping billions of dollars into. Have a look at the Aboriginal area. The closing the gap is just an appalling example of the fact that somehow we know best, we will drive the cavalry out of Canberra and we continue to do that. And the result is many Aboriginal people on all of those closing the gap indicators, they are not closing at all. Average time of friends now. 2013, seven hours a week we used to spend with friends. The average Australian now spends three hours a week with friends. I don't think I want to live in this community. That's not a healthy community. It's not a caring community. And how do we begin to change that? And the biggest pandemic we face is called loneliness. And the simple reality is that in 2018, one in four people recorded that they, they experienced significant periods of time when they felt lonely, many of them permanently. It's now one in three. And yet we continue to pour money into depression, into kind of like all these things, and it is a traditional model. What's missing? Community. Community is missing out of all of this stuff. And it's because, as a good docker person, I like a good footy analogy, we actually do community like we play football. Where 30,000 people who need the exercise now turn up to watch 36 players who don't. <laughs> and it seems to me while we continue to practice that type of community development where people now are recipients of what other people do to and for them, we will never kind of like build community. What I'm interested in, what can we do to start creating circumstances and situations and activities where people become co-owners, co-producers, and where their gifts are kind of like first and foremost, kind of like part of where it's all going. Look at volunteering, massive decline. And you know, in the last six years, we now have 1.5 million less volunteers in Australia. Population's gone up, volunteering is going down. What's happened? What's happened to this thing called community, despite how much we have actually invested in it and so on? And in the words of Robert Putnam, who we call the godfather of the single <coughs> social capital, the bonds of our community are with it. And I believe the starting point for community development is rebuild community, rebuild people's connection with each other. 
They spend time as part of the post-earthquake response team into Christchurch when those horrific earthquakes happened 12 years ago. I was at the 10th anniversary, and I love when the mayor got up and said, you know, we've done all the work, and we've worked out that the people who coped best at the time of that earthquake and have coped best since were not people who had an emergency plan, not people who had emergency supplies, but people who simply had good relationships with their neighbours. And the new Christchurch needs to be about, she said, building people's connection with each other. And that is what I hunger for as the model for what community development's about. There's a whole pile of consequences of the model that we are constantly following. And what I'm interested in is how do we begin to change that? And there is change happening, and we owe a lot to these two guys. These were two academics out of Christ out of uh, Chicago, who got a, a, a research grant to go into 300 of the worst kind of like inner city communities of the United States in 20 cities. And fundamentally, over a three year period, they had this journey across the country where they basically brought together people in the community, often around the kitchen table, often in little halls. And their question was very different to most researchers. Tell us a time, a story, about a time when you and your neighbours came together to make things better. Most people have been asked that. Most people ask, what's the matter? Not what matters to you. And so this particular group kind of like had that. And over the course of three years, they collected 3,000 stories of community change. And when they looked at all those stories, two things stood out. Firstly, people recognised it was when they became part of the action. Instead of waiting for the cavalry from outside the community, it's when they, as a community, as a group of neighbours, took action. And secondly, it's when they stopped waiting for those external resources, i.e. the letter from the, from the grant maker that tell you got the money to do it. When they started looking within their own community what assets and resources they had. That's when change actually happened. And the result of it, they then went on to write what's called the seminal book on this called ABCD. I don't encourage anyone to read it. It's probably the most boring book I've ever tried. <laughs> I haven't yet found one person who's ever finished reading it, but uh, we give these guys the, quite the total um, respect. They were the ones who created it. They went on to create what's called the Asset-Based Institute in Chicago. An amazing story. And the result is, across the world now, people are starting to challenge the existing model and beginning to say, you build communities from the inside out. And what they've fundamentally said is, the way you look at community, the lens that you use, will influence how you interact with people. So if all you see is emptiness and need and problem and limitation, that's how you will respond. And so the lens is so important. And so fundamentally, what they're saying is, there's another way of moving forward. They're not saying eliminate them the map on the left, the, the approach on the left, but what they are saying is let's have a lot less of it, and let's have more of the stuff on the right. Let's start from an inside out approach. Let's begin to focus on people's strengths and contributions. Let's begin to not call people clients and consumers and customers and all those other terms we've invented. Let's see them as citizens, co-workers, co-designers of what we're actually doing. Let's instead of following a silo approach, let's get into this thing called collaboration, and is that servicing community? Why don't we actually value what we do in terms of how we strengthen the community? And why don't we have indicators that look at that? And as well as having all the professionals, why don't we encourage much more building of capacity at the local level, what they refer to as leadership by stepping back. And so they're not saying about eliminating it, but they're saying less and more of that. And so there are two ways forward, and I suppose what I want about in challenging you is saying how much are you working on that latter one in terms of where it's at? Because you know what, while we continue to just do things to people and, with, and for people, which is the traditional helping model, and, and forget the two at the bottom, we go nowhere. I had to pick the one that transforms community and moves it away from being a set of transactions. It's the top, the bottom, right-hand quadrant. How do we open that space called of and by the community? And so how do we begin to see residents that we're working with in our communities? 
and moving them from being clients and recipients to actually being co-producers with us in terms of what's actually going on. That's what I'm excited about. I'm excited about moving from kind of like seeing people as clients to seeing people as citizens in terms of where it's all at. And so I encourage you to think about that. And to think about the fact that there's no two-tiered society where there's one group with all the problems who are rescued by the other group with all the solutions. There's only us and how we might do it. And that was put so well by one of our great Aboriginal leaders in Central Australia. So if you come to help me, you're wasting your time. But if you come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let's work together. And to me, that's what I'm really on about. I want to just finish with three quick little illustrations. Get away from the theory. I want to show you how this works in action. The first is, I just spent two years working in Somalia. And my first job when I came back was to go and work with the Mira people in a place called Machinbari in a community in Kakadu. This particular group, there's only 33 Mira people left. They have been decimated by disease. When I drove into this community, I could not believe what I saw. It's one of the most dysfunctional communities I've ever seen. The place was trashed. Employment levels were non-existent. Kids going to school was non-existent. Health, domestic violence was out of control. And yet, this group owned a uranium mine. They used to get up to $20 million in royalties every year. And I thought, where's all the money gone? But I quickly saw, it was called the White Toyota Cavalry that marched in every day, all in the name of helping this particular group. Anyway, why I was there is the group and the local leader said, look, Peter, we want a different approach. We've asked you not to come here to run some meetings and tell us how bad we are. We know what doesn't work. We don't want to focus on what's wrong. We want not meetings, but conversations about what is right. What is it we've got that we can take control of? And so using the oldest tool in the toolbox for building communities called conversation, not meetings, we started asking people about what have you got? Where do you want to go? What's your vision for this place? And more important, what do you want to play in making it happen? Not what's the matter, but what matters to you? And over this and over a whole series of conversations, beginning to identify these incredible physical assets they had, and beginning to identify what's possible, including the fact that 13 k's out of the town, they've just identified the oldest known settlement site in the world, has just been identified by archaeologists, 71,000 years, like 20, 30,000 years before the New Pyramids. All that on their property. But it was the personal stuff that people wanted to talk about. And so each of the conversations with people was, tell us, what do you care about? Now, Mark is one of the elders. His art sells for up to $20,000 a piece. When I asked him, what do you care about, Mark? I thought he'd talk about art. He didn't, he talked about horses. He'd been raised on a cattle station. He had this belief that young men and a relationship with a horse is the most powerful relationship forming business you can engage in. And so what he wanted to start up was a horseback tourism business because of the impact it could have on his young men. And everyone had a different kind of gift that they brought to the equation. All of that was then put into art led by Mark and they started to develop their strategic plan. And their strategic plan was a piece of art. What they wanted to do was to picture where could they go. And so together they started to construct their vision. And today, that's where it's at. Now what was interesting, that had the community horticultural gun, it had the corral stuff, it had the fence to keep out alcohol, and when they finished it, they said, we want to look at it from three points. Firstly, what is it about that we can do for ourselves that we don't need anyone's help? And so much they had. Secondly, what is it we can do with a little bit of help? We know all about horses. What we can do with some of their help is develop up a tourism strategy. And thirdly, what is it we know we can't do that we would appreciate outside intervention? And domestic violence was a huge issue that they wanted outside intervention with. That's the order of questions. Absolutely amazing. My second quick question. I was invited to go to this place in Cincinnati 
Baptist minister, craziest Baptist minister ever seen, had a ponytail right down past his bum. Never saw a Baptist minister like that before. What I've been, what I was sent to see is what they do every night of the week. They run a soup kitchen for 200 homeless and unemployed people. And I thought, what can I learn from that? They used to work in a soup kitchen. I have huge admiration for people. I think it's the ultimate in compassion. But I quickly realised this was no community feeding centre. This was a community eating centre. I couldn't work out who were the churches and who were the, the homeless. This was one big family having a meal. And then crazy things happened that night. They had their own resident jazz band. They had their own resident comedian. It was just the most amazing night. I couldn't wait for the end of the night to say to Damon and the next to the tell us, mate, what's happened here? This is not your typical soup kitchen. He said, if you come here six months ago, you would have seen a typical one. 200 people came in, we fed them, we felt good about that, they went out the next night, they were back. We fed them, we felt good about that, they went out the next night, they were back. And that went on until I made the ultimate management mistake. I hired a typical millennial young woman and he said, you know what they like, they want to change everything within 10 minutes. She said to me, Pastor, we're doing a good job, but guess what, Pastor? Their lives are not changing. And the reason their lives are not changing is we do not know them. So what did he do? He had 20 young people in his congregation and he taught them a technique called appreciative inquiry. Does anyone use it? Yeah. yeah, it's a way of holding a conversation with people to drill into the positive core of a person, not the negative. And he used questions like that. And if you have a look at those questions, what? how are they characterised? How many questions there about homelessness? How many questions there about unemployment? None. What are they about? They're about what's good about you? What's your contribution? What could you do? You know, the first thing you discovered out of 200 people, over 100 of them like cooking. And yet they employed a commercial chef. He got sacked. They invited 35 of the group to take over all the catering. Within six months, every one of them was working somewhere in the hospitality industry. Why did I see a resident jazz band the night I was there? Because out of 200 people, 51 of them had played a musical instrument at some stage in their life and we joined them up. I had a conversation with a guy who says, oh, as a young person, I love fishing. I've been through police checks. I now take two boys from a single current family where there's no kind of like role model. Adult role model. Role, role model. And in the words of Damon Lynch III, we were feeding folks, but we were not getting to know them. And I suppose what I'm interested in is how we change all of that. And finally, why am I personally on this campaign? Well, I've seen it happen in my own family. My uncle was like, you would call him the kind of like the wild boy of our family. He went off young and became an alcoholic and drug dependent. And I hadn't seen him for 30 years until I got a phone call from Fremantle Hospital to say this uncle you haven't seen is, is a chronic diabetic. We've had to amputate both of his legs. He's crying non-stop. We've had to tell him he's got less than six months to live and he's asked if you can come and take him home back to your town. The most horrific phone call of my life. When I got there, he was just sobbing and sobbing. And we took him back to our town in York in WA. The whole town rallied. Everyone was feeling sorry for him. The hospital provided a room for him to have. They provided him with it. And everyone said, let's make that last six months of life for Liz the best he could do. They were all focused on his problem. But one day, a young orderly bounced into the room and said, listen, Liz, our town's got a challenge. We no longer have a curious service between York and Perth. You know more about the trucking business than any other person. Les, you need to go into business and start a courier business between Perth and York. The night I went to see him, he said, Pete, I'm going into business. I said, you're what? You're going into business? And he said, yeah, I've had the men shed in here today. They're helping to modify a car I can drive without legs. They're modifying a trailer that I can easily attach. And as I reflect on it, I've got the ultimate marketing strategy. I'm going to call the business Legless Lessers. <laughs> <laughs> Can I say, 
He went on to live for seven years, yeah. doing that he was given six months. For seven years, he eventually moved out of that hospital and started to create a whole independent. And I will always be eternally thankful for that young orderly. The first person in the town that decided to have a conversation with what Liz had to contribute rather than the problems and the disabilities that he experienced. His focus was on abilities, not on disabilities. So what have I learned from those three stories? Well, this is what I leave you with. Start with what is strong, not necessarily what's wrong. Don't do anything for anyone they can do for themselves. Healthy communities create a place for everyone's gifts, no exception. And particularly those people we love to put a label on, we need to make sure their gifts are collect made available. Everyone cares about something, and part of that's their motivation for involvement. Finally, can I just say, let's have a lot more conversations, less meetings, less services, more community, and let's always see that communities are untapped reservoirs and possibility. We are not there to help people. We are there to create community for all of us. And that's what I think the community development model increasingly leads to collect regain. If you want the ultimate book on this, this one is it called When People Care Enough to Act, written by two people for their two daughters who have major development challenges in their life. And they wrote a book that whenever they're not around to care for their daughters, whatever community their two daughters that are on that front cover choose to be in, in the words of Mike Green, one of the fathers, we want so much that daughters know community life is truly good. My dream has always been that Anne will get the chance to live a life where she is needed for her gifts. It is by far the best and like book I know in terms of revolutionising our thinking about how we make people co kind of like designers and participants with us. And in closing, two goal hopes. One, what I've talked about tonight hasn't suddenly been invented 30 years ago in Chicago. This wise Chinese guy put it very well. Go to the people, live among them, learn from them, love them. Start with what they know, build on what they have, but are the best leaders when the task is done, the people remark, we have done it ourselves. I have a friend, a faith friend, who is an assistant minister in church, has that on a desk every day to remind her what community development is all about. On the other side, she wants to be reminded what the everyday reality is, and that is go to the people with an agenda, find out what's wrong with them, tell them Tell them what to do, enable and fix them, start with what they don't know, tell them what you think they should know, but of the worst leaders, when the program is done, the people remark, what have you done to us? She <laughs> said, every day, Joanne, I have a choice. Is it kind of like that, or is it that? I leave you to reflect on the difference.